Hey folks, this is Todd Coburn of Cal Poly Pomona with the Aerospace Structure Series. Today we're going to start on a three-part look at how to evaluate welds. Today's video will be on understanding how to analyze, how to understand welds, and how to analyze the welds for static strength. The video after that We'll look at simplified analysis that will apply to some welds. Our third video will cover weld fatigue. So let's get started. So first, when we're evaluating welds, we need to be able to understand from the drawing what this weld is that we're looking at. Or, if we're actually doing the design, to impart to the drawing what is the information about that weld that's critical, how that's going to be made. The way you do this is with, with, with the weld leader line, okay? A, the weld information or leader line is going to have two parts. Is you're going to have a horizontal line and you're going to have a leader with an arrow pointing at some point of the part which tells, uh, gives information about where that weld goes. <clears throat> you're going to see a number of pieces of information. The first piece of information we're going to look for after we see that horizontal line and that leader line is and where that arrow is pointing is the weld symbol. So you'll notice in brackets it says this weld symbol. It could be either above that horizontal line or below the horizontal line. Now, if that weld symbol is below the horizontal line, that tells us the weld is on the arrow side or right wherever that arrow is pointing, that's where the weld goes. If that weld symbol is on the far side of the horizontal line, which means not the arrow side, then that means it goes not where the weld arrow is pointing, but on the other side of the part is where the weld goes. So that uh, horizontal line, the arrow, and where that symbol is relative to the horizontal line is important. Okay, That symbol tells us what kind of weld, whether it's a butt weld, a fillet weld, or something else. The second piece of information is the weld size. It's shown as H in this picture. So you're going to see weld size and then the weld symbol right above that line or below the line. The weld size is the size. So like a 3 8 inch weld would be 3 8 would be the number we would see there in the H spot. Okay. Most welds will have this leader line and the horizontal line. It will have a weld symbol and a size. Okay. Some welds, that's all you're going to have. Other welds may have other information as well. For example, let's say there's another number after the weld symbol that's shown as L here. If that's true, that tells us how long the weld is. Now, if there's no symbol, then that means wherever that weld points, so let's say that uh, H is above the line like this, that means it's on the far side of the part. And if there's no length call out, that weld goes the entire length of the part as far as it can go. However, if we see a number where this L is, that says that the weld is only that long. So if there's a 1 there, that means it's only a 1-inch weld, long weld, not a continuous weld down the end of the part. Okay. Now, if there's a second number, an L, a number, and then a dash, and another number, that the second number is the pitch or the spacing of welds. So if we have a 1-3, that would mean the weld is 1 inch long, and then they're repeated every 3 inches, and if... Uh, there's no other information. We will assume that that pattern of one inch long by every three inches occurs uh, the entire length of the part as long as it can until the end of the part. Unless there's a number symbol. See down here the little N in parentheses? If there's a number symbol down there, that means it's repeated a certain number of times. So if there's no length information, you won't see a number symbol. But if there's length and pitch, then you see it may be a two, which means you do it twice. Three, which means you do it three times, and so on. Okay? So we got the size, we got the symbol, we have the length, the pitch. If those two are missing, then it's the whole length of the part. The other piece of information we see here is this little circle right at the joining of the leader line with the horizontal line. That little circle is the all-around symbol. That applies to whenever we have a feature, like let's say that you're welding a Coke bottle to some plate or something. That means that the weld is going to go all the way around the part. Got it? So let's look at a couple examples. For example, if we have this call out, now this is actually a fillet weld symbol. This is what a fillet weld symbol looks like. You can see here this S is the size. It was H up here. Now we're calling it S. That's the size of the fillet weld. 
And we can see that this is a near side, which means that the weld is occurring right where this arrow is pointing. This, uh, this one, this symbol is identical, but you'll notice now the symbol and the size are ab above the line, which is on the far side relative to the arrow. This means the weld doesn't go where the arrow is pointing, it goes on the other side of the part. Now, if the arrow had been pointing up, then this would have been a near side arrow. A far side one would have occurred down here, okay? So we're looking at which side is the arrow on, which side is the symbol on. If the symbol is on the same side as the arrow, then it's a near side weld. If it's on a far side relative to the arrow, then it means it's a far side weld. This symbol, these little snake bites, this is a uh, butt weld symbol, which means it's a butt weld, not a fillet weld. Once again, that's the size, okay? So let's take a look further. Uh, let's start out with uh, like, so if we have uh, two plates, these plates are not joined, and then we see this weld symbol, we see there's an arrow and it's pointing to the plate. That means, and then we see that the weld symbol is on the near side, the, the arrow side, which means we're going to start from right where the arrow is pointing and we're going to start putting our weld in. We're going to use a butt weld, and that means we're just going to fill up that joint with, with uh, weld material and a size H. Now, Usually when we see this, that H will be the same dimension as your thickness dimension. That would be a complete joint penetration weld. Okay, if H is equal to T. But if H is less than T, then that means we didn't get all the way through the part. That would be a partial joint penetration weld. So you're going to see an H, and that H may be the full thickness of the plate. Usually that's what you'll see. It might be less. So if this is a full joint, if H is equal to T, then it doesn't really matter whether it's a near side or a far side butt weld because it will look the same when you're done. But if it's a partial joint penetration weld, then it may make a difference whether that starts from the top, where the top will be filled, or the bottom, where the bottom will be filled. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, so what the way this will look is this will look like this. Now, if H is less than T, then it would look, it wouldn't go all the way through the part. You'll notice there's a bunch of other crap up on top, and that's because when we weld, we tend to get a lot of extra weld material on top, not just the stuff that goes down in. Reminds me when I try to solder pipe, it's always a mess. And that's called, that extra material is called reinforcement. It actually increases our strength a little bit because it increases the cross-sectional area. At least it increases our static strength. But it can tend to reduce the fatigue strength. So we tend to remove it by sanding, grinding, or something else. Regardless whether we remove that reinforcement or not, we're not going to include the reinforcement in our strength calculations. We're going to just assume that that is just the weld is only where material is only where it's supposed to be in that H dimension. Now, a fillet weld would be called out like this. We see here the arrow is going to the spot here. And the, arrow, the fillet symbol is on the same side as the arrow, which means that fillet weld occurs right here where the arrow is touching, and it's of size H. Now, that size H in this case is not just the depth of the weld. That's the two dimensions of the fillet weld. Since there's only one dimension here, we're going to assume that it's an H by H weld. The height and the length is H, and then it's basically a, a straight line between them. Now, a bad weld will be a little concave, and a good weld will be a little convex, but uh, we're going to pretend that no matter what it is, it's just an H by H weld, okay? That's how it works. All right, if no, once again, we said before, if no length of the weld is specified, you'll notice there's no length information for each, either of these welds, just a size dimension. This means these welds will occur the entire length of the part from one end to the other. And if it is specified, then it just extends to that distance. And if the pitch is specified, then we got a repeated thing as we discussed before. And we also talked about this, a complete joint penetration versus a partial joint penetration weld, one that goes all the way through or not. In this case up here, if H is equal to T, that's a complete joint penetration weld. Got it? All right, so let's take a look at our stresses, how to calculate stresses in butt welds. Here's a little sketch of a typical butt weld. You'll notice I sketched the reinforcement on there too. Remember, we're going to ignore that. Okay. Now, a good, a through uh, a, a complete joint penetration butt weld is going to restore all of the area. And if the electrode is chosen properly, and if it's a very weldable material, 
And if you restore any heat treat that might be in the part, then you may end up with a part as strong as the original part when you're done. This is common with titaniums. They're very weldable, some of them. And in that case, that kind of weld we will analyze in the normal way. You take a section cut through there, and then you would calculate your stresses, P over A, MC over I kind of stresses, okay? So uh, act, what that means is axial stress. If we have an axial force like this, we're going to take a cross-section through the weld, and we see that the stress on the weld is just P over A. The area is just the, uh, in this case, it's the T times the width of the plate. But in the weld itself, remember that its dimension is the H dimension and the L dimension of the weld. So we could say this P over HL, where uh, it often H will be equal to, be to the to thickness, but uh, it also could be less if it's not a complete joint penetration weld, okay? Now, if you happen to have bending, let's say your pet plate is bending like this, that would give us a bending moment as well. Then we would calculate our stress as MC over I. The C is just T over 2. The I is 112B T cubed, right? Now, a common formula for rectangular sections like this is uh, when you resolve that T over 2 with the 112B T cubed, you get the simplified formula for any rectangular shape, 6M over BT squared for your stresses. So it's 6M over BT squared, 6 times the moment divided by the length of the weld and the H dimension of the weld squared. Now, if you have axial load and moment, then you have to resolve those stresses. You got the P over A plus the MC over I is shown over here to the right. Got it? This little subscript B just means that it's bending. Now, if you have shear stress, now, we saw that this other one was an axial force. If we have a shear force acting in the plane like this, that's a shear force. Now, we could just say it's P over A. That's true. But a lot of times, I like to call a shear force S. Use the symbol S for cap uh, shear force. So that force S divided by the area, the area once again is just HL, so our stresses are just S over HL. Got it? Now, if we have a, now all this is for if we have a complete joint penetration weld. Remember, if we have a partial joint penetration weld, what happens is the force, even under an axial force, the force is here at the centroid of the plate, and then you get the partial joint penetration weld, and once it goes through there, it wants to, the force has to be carried through the centroid of that, which gives it a little eccentricity from T over 2 to H over 2, which means that little eccentricity E is just the T over 2 minus the H over 2, which is T minus H over 2. So the moment, the secondary moment that develops right there at the cross section is that P times T minus H over 2. Once you've calculated this moment, you can then use this upper right equation to calculate the P over A and the MC over I kind of stresses. Got that? Now, here are some examples of other welds that behave like a butt weld, right? We've got the butt weld or square weld on the left. We've got a V weld, bevel weld, U weld, J weld, you name it. All these would be handled exactly the same. We take a cross section through and we can use these formulas to evaluate them, okay? Once again, if there's reinforcement, we're typically going to ignore it. And if you have a fatigue joint that needs to be good for fatigue, we'll often grind that off. Got that? That's how we analyze butt welds for stress. Now, if we get fillet welds, it's a little more complicated. Before we go further, let's look a little further to make sure we can understand those fillet weld symbols. Okay? This is, uh, we can see here, we have two plates. We have a horizontal plate and a vertical plate, and our weld symbol says we have back-to-back -back fillet welds. Now, you'll notice here that there's some ambiguity. This arrow is pointing right at that corner. So back-to-back -back could mean, yes, we need a weld there, and we need a weld on the far side. But you'll notice there's two far sides. There's a far side over here and the far side down here. But if we look at this, this plate, this joint, we see that there's nothing to put a fillet weld on beneath. That means it's got to be over here that that fillet weld is. So this should warn us that there's some ambiguity with figuring out whenever we use a far side weld, we need to be really clear with our drawing to show so that our part is built as we wanted it to be built. In this case, we have a back-to-back -back fillet weld of size H. Now you'll notice the H is only on one of the fillet welds. It's not on the other. And that means that they're going to be the same, right? There's an H by H weld on each side of the plate. As shown to the right here, 
And that h dimension means the height and the width of that is both are both h. Okay. Here's another well. Once again, same kind of plate joint. This one's calling out a one quarter by three eighths inch for your size of the weld. That means it's an unbalanced weld. That means one dimension of the little fillet is smaller than the other. This is kind of a no-no. It can result in some bad strength. Anytime we see this, we're just going to utilize the smaller dimension as if it's a balanced weld to be conservative. Okay? You'll see that this symbol is on the near side. That means it's a near side weld. You'll notice here, once again, the same plate. We got an H symbol and we have a, it's a fillet weld on the near side and it's five inches long. Since there's a length call out, it's no longer the full length of the part, it's only five inches. So if your part is like this, you see you've got an H by H weld and it's five inches long. You'll notice it doesn't tell us where to put that weld. That's kind of sloppy in my opinion, but that's how it's done. This call out here, once again, same kind of plate. You can see uh, our symbol's a little different. You see it's a near side weld. We have a weld of dimension, it's a fillet weld of dimension H. That weld is one inch long. And you'll notice it's a back-to-back -back weld, but you'll notice the two fillet symbols aren't aligned. One is further back here. So we have an H weld on the near side, and, and it's one inch long. And then we see the pitch is three. So three inches later, you have the other fillet weld on the back side. You can see, so we've got the near side one inch weld, Three inches later, you got the backside one inch weld. Three inches later, you got the near side fillet weld. Now that you'll notice there's no end call out from the number of times, which means we're going to do this as many times as we need to get to to get from one end of the plate to the other, making sure that each, uh, as we go along, we're going to put a one inch weld, a three inch space, a one inch weld, a three inch space, and so on. Okay? All right. Here's another little call out. You see, we're looking down on this post. We have a, a weld, it's a far side weld of dimension H, but we have the all around symbol, which means we start from the far side and we go all the way around that thing. So it looks like this picture to the right, okay? So that is just some simple ideas for how to recognize fillet welds. Let's look at the stresses in fillet welds. Okay. So here is, you'll notice we have three plates. There's a horizontal plate, and there's a plate above and a plate below. And right here at the joint, it's welded together with fillet welds, okay? You'll notice the weld on the force on the middle plate is 2F. This is an example out of Shigley. And you'll, that means that each plate, the top and bottom plate, will each carry a force F. You see that weld. Let's look at the weld dimensions. We've got A, B, C, and then this plane D, right? There are this D point, which defines a plane from B to D. That throat area in that minimum dimension is that D, B dimension. Now let's imagine cutting the plate off right there through D, B, which removes the upper plate. And then we place that. That's the middlemost picture. We see the uppermost plate with half of the fillet weld aligned to it. Okay. You'll see that we've got a section cut through there. And you'll notice that we can have stresses in that weld. In fact, no matter where, if this is our fillet weld, no matter where we cut it, here we're going to have a stress distribution, here we're going to have a stress distribution, we're going to have different stress distributions all the way in between. If we cut that plane, you can see on this little cut surface, there's going to be a shear force and a axial force. There actually is a moment as well that's not shown here. We can calculate how much shear force we have and how much moment we have by just using trigonometry. The summation of force is the force, the shear force and the, and the uh, normal force are calculated here using the law of sines. We can solve the throat thickness, calculate the stress at any angle for any cut at any angle, and even calculate a von Mises stress. Okay, So if we plug this in, we can calculate the stress distribution at any angle. Now you can imagine it's probably critical right there at the minimum throat area. Let's look at this a little further. Let's look at closer at that. Here's a single fillet weld. A, B, C, right, is a single fillet weld. You see we've got this B, C plane, and we've got the A, B plane. If we look at the stresses on that B, C plane, that's what this lowermost picture, we got two pictures on the bottom, right, a left and a right. The left picture is looking at these two surfaces of the fillet weld. Here's the the fillet weld is this dimension by this dimension. We've got this surface and this surface. 
If we look at the stresses on this surface, you can see that plate's pulling off. It's just P over A, right? But actually, it's not a uniform P over A. What we're going to get is a cheating up of load. You'll notice the stress distribution is so shown solid there in the lower left picture. You can see we have a nonlinear stress distribution. That's the normal stress distribution. More stress is carried down there near the other plate than up near the top. The shear stress distribution along that surface, now it looks like the shear stress is zero, but actually it's not. We get a little non-uniform. That's the dashed line on that vertical BC line. Now looking at that same lower left picture, we can look at the other. Here's our fillet weld again. And looking at this surface from A to B, and we see that one should have a shear stress and it should have bending on it. The bending stress we see is nonlinear, that solid line nonlinear stress, and the shear stress is building up uh, as you move away down toward the toe of that weld. You got that? Now, if we took that, looked at the stress distribution at that central cut from B to D, that's what that lower right figure does, and it shows that the normal stress is much more uniform. It's not, uh, it's still nonlinear, and the shear stress also is nonlinear, okay? So these are the detailed stress distributions for our fillet weld. Now, some of you are starting to pucker up and go, oh my gosh, what the heck is this? This looks like calculus, not like engineering, <laughs> right? But actually, if we go and we calculate these stresses and then we go and test parts, it's been found that these stresses, the test results don't match these stresses hardly at all. Why would we do this much detail work if we're not going to get good test results? Now, this is good analysis as long as the test supports that idea. If the test is not supporting that idea, maybe this is not doing a very good representing it. So it's too complicated and it doesn't even work very well. So we're going to abandon this approach and use something much simpler. Let's take a look at the simple model that we're going to use. I called this uh, slide the fillet weld stress model. What I really mean is this is fillet weld detail stresses. Our model or idealization we're going to see on the next slide. Now, what we're going to do when we find a fillet weld is we're going to pretend that we're going to resolve all of the stresses that might occur, and we're going to resolve them into shear stresses, and we're going to pretend that they all occur right there in the weld. Let's look at the leftmost picture. You can see two plates are put together with a fillet weld. What we're going to do is we're going to calculate the minimum area of that fillet weld. That is that inclined shaded plane. We look at our weld, we got the H and the H, and that means the smallest weld dimension, if we cut that through at 45 degrees, that will give us the smallest distance here. So if this is H and this is H, and this dimension at the throat is 0.707H. And the other dimension of that area, that inclined plane going into the plate, is the length of the weld. So 0.707H times L is the area that that shear stress that we're going to imagine occurs is acting on, okay? Now you'll notice the centroid of that inclined plane is out here somewhere. We're going to ignore all that. We're going to pretend that all that area is collapsed down into a point right at the intersection, right at the right at that little tiny point here at the, uh, the weld, okay? Now unfortunately these three pictures, I, for whatever reason, I chose different orientation. The leftmost picture, I go two plates with a fillet weld over here. In the right two pictures, I got the fillet weld on the other side. It's the same idea. These aren't the same weld. Left picture is one weld. These other two pictures are different weld. Let's look at the second, the middlemost picture. We got the fillet weld on the other side. Once again, we're seeing the H and the H dimension. That throat area is that 0.707H. What we're going to do is calculate the area on that 0.707H times L, and we're going to collapse that down like a black hole, right? We're going to collapse that down into a single point. We're going to imagine that that area, 0.707HL, is tiny little point area right at the intersection of those two legs of the fillet weld, as shown in the rightmost picture. So if we have a near side weld, it would occur right in that spot. In our leftmost picture, it's occurring right at the joining of the two plates. It's like having a little point area or a little line. It's like we got a little, like a long point, right? So now that doesn't come into play in terms of calculating the area because the area is just 0.707HL. But later when we start evaluating 
the properties of weld patterns, it's going to be important to be able to locate this weld, and we will locate it based on where that root of the fillet weld is, as if all of the area occurs right at that spot. You got that? Okay. So our assumptions, we're assuming that our, our stresses are shear stresses. No matter what the orientation of the stresses are, we're going to calculate P over here. We're going to pretend they're shear. That weld width dimension is the minimum throw dimension, 0.707H. The weld area is then 0.707HL. The weld is idealized, the weld is idealized as a line or a long point. Okay? Our shear stress then is just P over A, which is P over 0.707HL. Sound pretty simple? All right. Let's look at a couple simple cases. Sometimes we'll have welds that are so simple we can analyze them quite quickly and directly. Okay? Other times we're going to have to do more work. Okay, this is actually two different parts. We've got this left set of pictures, which is one weld, and this right set of pictures, which is another weld. Let's look at the left one first. The uppermost left, upper left picture is looking down on the part. We see we have two plates. The middlemost picture shows looking at the side of it. We've got a vertical plate and two horizontal plates. We can see we have a weld. It's a back-to-back -back fillet weld of dimension H. Okay. So uh, if we look at an isometric, that's that picture down below. If we apply a vertical force on this, we can see that's going to be reacted by our two welds. Since this load looks like it's acting right through the centroid of that weld pattern, we can just say, say that the force per weld is just P over 2. The area of the weld is 0.707 HL. So our shear stress is just P over 2 over 0.707 HL. Got it? Now, looking at the rightmost set of pictures, once again, we're looking down. Once again, we have a back-to-back -back symbol, as we see in the middle picture. Uh, excuse me, a back-to-back -back fillet welds. And if we load the plate as shown in the lower right picture with that P force, we can see that will be reacted. And each plate will take P over 2. Those welds are have that root dimension, 0.707H. They have a length of however length is in is a... Uh, the weld, and that means we're going to have P over 2, point over 0.707H again, uh, L again. Does that make sense? That's our shear stress. So we can do these kind of problems rather quickly. Now, if the forces aren't acting through the centroid of the fastener pattern, then it's a little trickier. And so we're going to develop a method to analyze those. It's actually quite simple and straightforward, but you're going to need to make sure you spend enough time, invest enough time to master the process. Let's start out by looking at the process as a whole. So let's say we have this plate. It looks like we have a vertical C channel and we have a rectangular plate hanging off of it. And we have that plate loaded. If you look at our weld symbol, it looks like we have an all around weld. Now that's a curious call out. It's an all-around symbol, but we can see then that we have a fillet weld on the near side that we can see, and a fillet weld going down, and a fillet weld going down. And then, to continue all around, it's got to go to the back side for the fillet weld. See how that works? Okay. So that's our weld. Basically, four welds. One, two, three, four. Now, in order to analyze this, this is the process that we're going to use. First, we're going to identify all welds. Looks like we have four welds. They're all fillet welds of a size H. Great. We're going to need the type, fillet weld, the dimensions, that means H and L, and the locations, which means where is the centroid of each weld. Now, if we look at our plate and with the uh, coordinate system drawn as shown, we see that these two horizontal welds will be located at an X dimension. Their, their centroid is at the length of that weld over 2, right? The length of that weld over 2. The Y position of the center of the weld, of this lower weld, is at zero, and the other one is at the height of the plate. You see that? Okay. If we look at our two vertical welds, we see the leftmost weld has got an X position of zero, and the rightmost weld has an X position of whatever this distance is. Uh, it's called WX1 uh, equals WX3. Okay. Our Y position of those two are both just the height of this over 2, right? The length of those welds over 2. All right. So once we've identified all of the welds, 
We then are going to choose a coordinate system. I recommend you choose the lower left corner for your coordinate system and identify your X and your Y. Then we're going to identify our loads. You can see this particular thing has two forces on it. Could also have other loads and other moments. We need the type. Looks like we have two forces. The magnitude, whatever the magnitude is. The direction, horizontal and vertical in this case. And the origin, where are these two applied? You with me? Okay. We then are going to construct a table of weld information to do our analysis. Now I'm going to show you how that's done and I'm going to walk you through that process and then we'll get some more equations to feed that table, okay? It looks like this. You can see in this table, we're going to have a bunch of columns. The first column is the number of the weld. We're going to number them one to whatever. One, two, three, four in this case, right? There may be more. We're going to have an H for each weld, whatever that H size dimension is. Put all those in. We're going to have a length of each weld, right? Two horizontal welds are that long. The two vertical welds are whatever this height of the plate is long. We then are going to have an X and a Y coordinate. We just walked through how to calculate the X coordinate. This is the X, Y of this weld, the X, Y of this weld, the X, Y of this weld, the X, Y of this weld. We're going to plug in those values. We then calculate the area, which is just the H times L. Excuse me, it's the 0 0.707 H times L, right? That populates this column. We then can add all these together, and that gives us the total area of the weld pattern. Okay? Then we can go and take the area of each times its X bar and populate each of these points. Sum all of those up. Now the sum of the AX's divided by the sum of the A's, that's going to give us the X bar of the panel. We then take each area and multiply by the Y to the centroid of it for each and every one of these. We add all these up, that gives us this. If we divide this by the area, that's going to give us the Y bar of the pattern. Once we know where the X bar and the Y, now in this particular case, we can see if this is a balanced weld like this, that's going to be right in the middle of those welds, right? We can see that by inspection, but often we won't be able to see it that easily. Once we've done all that, we can calculate the J of the weld. We're going to use all the information in this table, like the area, the X bar, and the Y bar, and we're going to use the X bar and Y bar of the total pattern in order to calculate the J. I'll give you the equation for that after this, but first all you need to know is we're going to calculate a J for each and every weld and we're going to put in this table. We're going to sum them up and that is going to be the torsional resistance of the weld pattern. You with me? Okay. Oh, before we do that, let's see how this works. I've got a little animation for you. you got to watch. It's kind of fast. This is how we construct our weld pattern, our weld analysis table. Populate each of those columns, add those puppies up. That's how you do it. You want to see it again? Just like this. I started doing it and then I realigned it. That happens about half the time or more. Okay. Once we've done that, we calculate our section properties as we discussed and as we're going to see on the next slide. We then are going to move. These forces need to be applied at the center of the pattern. Now, the forces aren't going to change, right? The force at the center of the pattern, we're going to have an X and a Y force of the same magnitude. However, when we move those forces that we saw back in statics, we're going to get a moment that develops based on these two forces not being applied initially at the center of the fastener pattern. I'll show you how to calculate that, that additional moment on the next slide. That's an equivalent force system. We're next going to have to figure out whether this is an in-plane weld pattern or an out-of-plane weld pattern. This is something that students struggle with. So an in-plane weld pattern is one where the loads induce stresses. You'll notice if we look at this weld, you'll notice all of the welds are in a single plane. We can have any kind of forces in those plane, that plane, and that's an in-plane weld. We can even have a moment that's perpendicular plane, and all the stress components will occur in the plane. If all the stresses occur in the same plane as the weld pattern, that's called an in-plane weld pattern. If any components come out of the plane, that's called an out-of-plane weld pattern. What does that mean? So if we have a component of stress coming out of the plane, then that's an out-of-plane. We'll look at that in a little bit. We'll look further at that to help you get that idea. 
Once we've identified whether it's an in-plane or out-of-plane weld pattern, we then identify which points need to be analyzed. Now with bolts, that was easy because we're just going to calculate a stress at each and every bolt. With welds, it's harder because we, before we use the X bar and the Y bar at the center of each weld, but when we calculate stresses, we're going to need the extreme points locations. For example, in this case, the four corners of the weld, any of those might be critical. Now, if we only had a vertical force at the centroid, then all the stresses are the same. If we only have a horizontal force, all the stress are the same. But if we have a moment, then we're going to find there's some corner that's more critical. As you get more experience, you might be able to spot immediately which point is critical. Right now, we can tell, well, it's going to be one of the four corners. So identify which points might be critical. And we're going to need the x and the y coordinate of those. For example, this lower left point is at 0, 0. This point down here is at this width times 0. This is at the width times the h value. And this is at 0, h. Okay? We're going to need those points in order to calculate stresses there. We then can compute our stresses. Now, you're probably a little confused. You know how to construct your table, but we didn't actually give you enough information to close the job. We'll show you that in just a minute. But first, let's look further at the idea of in-plane versus out-of-plane welds. Here's two welds. The left one is an in-plane weld, and the right one is not a plane weld. These are the same weld. We'll see we got a horizontal weld, a vertical weld, and then a short horizontal weld. Or excuse me, horizontal weld, and then a short vertical weld. You see that? And, oh, I guess they're not the same. They're almost the same. Then the other one is horizontal down and then back a little ways, okay? Let's look at this in-plane one first. Let's say we have a set of forces applied. We have this horizontal red force. That is going to induce, or actually orange, that's going to induce components of stress in the same direction. So you see those little air, orange arrows going around the part? They're all aiming in the same direction as that force. That's what that force induces. We also have this vertical blue force. That vertical blue force is going to cause stresses P over A, which is going to cause little components of stress that are acting in the same direction. See how those little small blue arrows? Those are the components of stress in the same direction. If we have a moment like that green moment, that's going to cause a components of stress that if you draw a line from the centroid of the, fast, of the weld pattern to the point you're looking at, it's going to be perpendicular to that point, just like we saw back in dynamics. Okay. So you'll see that this moment is going to cause stresses like this and this, like all these little green stresses. Okay. Now, all of these stresses that are generated by these forces lie in the plane. Therefore, this is an in-plane weld pattern. I'm going to give you a little animation so you can see this better. You're going to see that the weld itself is shown black, and these forces and the component stresses are all shown on different, with different colors. See that? So we have the weld pattern, and then you see the, each of the forces that are driving different components of stress. You see how that works? Okay. Now this rightmost one, you can see we have this kind of semi-C channel weld. We've got two forces, uh, three, we got two forces, a blue force, a red force, and a moment. See the green moment? So this red force is going to cause components of stress acting in plane to the weld, but it's also going to cause a moment as you see these other red stresses forming, tension on the top and compression on the bottom. The blue force is going to cause forces in plane like this, and it's also going to cause a moment that causes compression on this side of the weld and tension back here. That moment is going to cause compression on the top of the weld and tension on the bottom of the weld. So this, because we have, now you'll notice some of the components of stress are in plane and some of them are out of plane. Since some of them are out of plane, this is an out of plane weld. Remember, if any components of stress act out of plane, then it's called an out of plane weld for our purposes. Let's look at the animation. We look at that, there's our coordinate system, that's our weld, there's our forces, and these are the components of stress that they cause. Wanna see that again? Got that? Okay. So let's look first at in-plane weld. Let's say we determine that the weld is in-plane. For example, we have a vertical C channel 
and a plate is supplied. Looks like we have an all-around weld. It's a fillet weld, dimension H. We have two forces. These forces are not the centroid, so we're going to have to use a in uh, uh, in plane analysis weld pattern analysis. Okay. Now we're going to construct our table like we talked about before with n the number, and we're going to put in each of our welds and all that just like we talked about before. Okay. We're going to do that. But here are the formulas that we're going to be using as we populate that. Uh, we're going to look at those a little further. So actually, the x bar is just the sum of the x's over the sum of the a's, which we can write for our purposes as the width in this direction with the width of this direction, which for a weld, the width in one direction will be the 0.707h, and the width in the other direction will be l, right? For example, the vertical weld has a width dimension of 0.707h and a height dimension of l, okay? We can write this even simpler by just writing it that way. We can just say, well, it's the sum of the 0.707 HL times X's over the sum of the 0.707 HL. Now, while this formula is true, remember, we saw this already back when we were constructing our table. Remember, we had the number. We had the H and the L. We put in the X and the Y, and then we put in the A. All you got to do, calculate the A is just 0.707 HL, populate that, and the AX is just the A times the X bar of that, and you just put that in your table. You do it for each and every weld, and then you sum them up. That does the same thing as this equation. Then you take the sum of the X's or the sum of the A's, that gives you this, okay? So even though we're going to be using this equation, the way we're going to use it is in that table. That's the way to make the least errors for most people. You could even write it this way. If all H's are the same, you could just say it's the sum of the L's times X's over the sum of the L's. Okay. For the Y's, we're going to do that the same way and get the same thing. Once again, we're going to do this out of our table. Our areas are just written this way, and we saw we just multiplied 0.707H times each L. Now, if our weld pattern included, let's say, a bunch of fillet welds and maybe one butt weld, then we're not going to put a 0.707 on the butt weld, right? In that case, that weld would have an area of HL. The 0.707 springs into being whenever we have a fillet weld. Okay. Now our J, remember to calculate, now J is just the torsional stiffness. So what that means is we're going to have, so let's say we talk about the vertical weld here. The vertical weld has a resistance to moment, right? It resists a moment in plane. And the way it does, first, it's got a width and a height dimension cube, right? That resists moment. And then it's got a width and a height dimension, and that resists moment. So we've got 1 12th width times height cube plus 1 12th width times height cube plus the air. That's the, that's the moment of inertia or the, the torsional resistance of that about its own axis. But around the centroid of the weld pattern, we also have the term the area of that weld times the distance from the centroid of that weld to the centroid of the pattern squared. That's that AR squared term, okay? We can expand that. These first two terms are unchanged. We see that that area is just WX to WL. And we expand it further. We see, well, actually, this R is just the X minus X bar squared plus the Y minus Y bar squared, right? That's R squared. And then we can actually say, well, wait a minute. Actually, these width dimensions are 0.707h, or they're h times point, or l times uh, times l cubed, or they're l times 0.707h cubed. We can write it this way. And actually, when we look at this, we see well, h is much smaller than l, and if we cube h, it gets even smaller. Therefore, we can just ignore this term here. We're just going to throw that guy straight into hell, right? And just focus on the other two people pieces of this that are not negligible, which leaves us this equation, okay? Once we have that, so actually, now you'll notice here, going back a little bit, this J then is the summation of all these. Now, if you go and you try and apply this formula, you're welcome to do that. That will give you correct answers, except you're liable to make a mistake. It's got too much algebra. Most students will screw that up. So once again, the way we're going to do this, forget the summation. What we're going to do is for each and every weld, we're going to take 1 12th times the 0.707H of that weld times the L of that weld cubed plus the area of that weld times the quantity 
x of that weld minus the x bar of the pattern squared plus y of that weld minus the y bar of the pattern squared summation against that area add that to the other piece that is the torsional resistance of that one weld about the center of the pattern we put that in that little box that we had for j we do it for each and every weld and then when we sum those up that's going to give us this formula that gives us our j okay now we need the loads at the centroid now, I told you before we're going to move them. You learned how to move them in statics. Yes, you need to still be able to do that, but actually we can just apply this formula. Now, you'll notice this loading has only two forces. There's no moment applied. If we did have a moment, I'm calling that MZ, we would just put it here, right? Following right-hand rule, okay? So all these loads are following right-hand rule. So the moment in this case is zero. We have the PX, the horizontal force, the negative PX times the Y of the load. So the Y of the load for this guy if this is our coordinate system, the y of the load is this dimension here, yl, and the x of the load is actually, actually this is a little, oh yeah. So this x of the load goes all the way from this end to this end. You see that? This whole dimension, right? That's our x of the L load. So y of the load minus y bar times negative px plus x of the load minus x bar times PY added together. That's the total moment at the centroid of the pattern. We then can calculate the stress at any point using this formula. The stress in the X direction will be in the same way we did for fasteners, our shear stress in the X direction at any point. So what this means is we're going to have to first pick a point. Let's say we're going to analyze that lower left point. That means X and Y are both zero. We're going to plug in P divide by the area of the pattern minus the mz bar that we calculate over here times y of that point which is zero minus y bar of the pattern whatever we calculated divide that by j and that's going to give us the shear stress in the x direction okay we could apply this formula to each point each of the four corners we've got those corners at zero zero at this dimension zero this dimension, this dimension, and zero, this dimension. Got it? Okay. Four points, we can check that. We calculate the Y stress in the same manner at each of those points, and then we put them together in the same way we did, the same manner as we did back for fasteners. You got that? That's how we analyze a weld pattern for an in-plane loading. Now, once again, this is a lot of formulas. Remember, what we're going to do is construct our table. Plug in number one, two, three, four. Plug in the H and the L of each and every weld. Plug in the X position of the centroid of the weld and the Y position of the centroid of each weld. Then we're going to calculate the area of each weld, 0.707 HL. Sum those up, that's the total area. We don't have to apply that equation because we're following our tabular approach. We then take that area of each and multiply it by its x position. Populate that column. Sum up that column divided by the area column that gives us the x bar. We then take the area times the y position of each. Sum those up. Take that summation divide by the summation of the areas. That gives us the y bar. We don't have to apply that equation because that gives it to us. Then we apply this j equation for each and every weld which means we're going to have for the first weld, we're going to have 1 12th 0.707 HL cubed plus the area of that weld times its X position minus X of the weld pattern squared plus the Y position minus the Y of the pattern squared Add those two terms together, and that gives us that first J for the first weld. We do that again and again and again till we have them all. We sum those up, and that summation is our total J of the pattern that we plug into this formula to calculate our stresses. Got it? That's how we analyze each and every point. So that J subscript is for which point we're checking for uh, 
for the stresses. So if you're implementing this, you're going to create the table, which gives us the properties. And then you're going to calculate your stresses, which means you're going to need an X and a Y coordinate, and then you're going to need a tau X, a tau Y, and a tau resultant for any point that might be critical. Mostly those are going to be the extreme fibers, the welds. That's how we analyze in-plane welds. Now, if we get an out-of-plane weld, like this one, we're going to follow a similar procedure. Once again, we're going to have properties like this, X bar and Y bar, or Z bar and Y bar like this. Or now, instead of the resistance to that kind of bending, we call I. Now, you'll notice I about the X axis here is the same as the J in the XZ plane, as you can kind of see here. But we're going to call it an I. And you calculate it like this, just like we did before, in the same fashion. Now, the way we're going to actually implement this, we have all these equations. We're going to construct the same table we did before with the number of each weld, the H and the L of each weld, the position of each weld. We're going to calculate the area of each weld, same. Area X, area Y. Or in this case, we've got the area X, uh, Z, and the area Y, okay? Then we're going to calculate the I by taking this formula and applying it to each weld, which means we're going to take this uh, 1 12th, uh, the width dimension, in this case, the Y, you'll, you've got to be careful with the coordinate system. we got this Y dimension, so that's the width in the Y and the width in the Z, right? In this case, the width in the Z of all these for this coordinate system the width in the Y will just be the length of the vertical welds. The width in the Z will be 0.707H. Right? For the horizontal weld, the width in the Y is going to be 0.707H. And the width in the Z is just we're going to ignore that zero. The other term will give us 1 12th width in the Z, which is 0.707H, and our Y dimension. You got that? And then we got the area of those times the Y minus Y bar squared and so forth. Okay. Once we have that, we calculate our loads at the center of the pattern. This is the formula, which gets these forces about the centroid. In this case, we're looking at the moment about the X. And our shear stress at any point can be calculated in the same manner as before. But now, instead of having a J down below, we've got an I down below. Are you with me? Now, if you encounter a weld pattern, I would encourage you to follow the same nomenclature I have here to make sure you don't lose those, mess those equations up. So that's how that works. Okay, let's look at some practice of how we might assess these, okay? This is an example from Juvenile, and this is an L weld. If we have a load like this, we see we're going to get a component down all throughout the stress component down throughout the weld. We're also going to get a component like this, which is going to give us little components like this. All those stress components are in the plane of the weld. The, the uh, forces are all in the plane of the weld. And the moment this cause is perpendicular, which means it's causing stresses in the plane of the weld. Therefore, this is an in-plane weld. And that force would move here, and it would be resolved as a for shear force in a moment. And the Moment's going to give us components like this. I'm going to show it to you at two points. It's also all throughout the weld, the same kind of thing. The vertical force gives us a component like this. And we resolve those together, which means we add those components. That's the resultant of those three forces. This is a resultant of those three forces. You can see this point A is more critical. We only need to calculate the stress there. And that's how that looks in detail. Another example from Juvenile. In this case, we see this vertical force is causing in-plane stresses, but it's also causing a moment like this, which is causing out-of-plane stresses. So this is an out-of-plane weld. So that vertical force, we got those are two forces. The moment causes, now actually the moment causes stresses all along here and all along here, and it's going to be a linear distribution between. I'm just showing the extreme values. Okay, and then that resolves into components like this. See how that works? And there's the, this is up at the top how that looks. Okay. 
If we have a weld like this, you can see this force is going right through the center of the fastener pattern or the weld pattern. Therefore, we don't have to do any fancy work. We can see, well, we can assume half the load goes each weld, that's F over two. And the area of that weld is just 0 0.707 H times L. So it's just two, it's just a PF over two over 0 0.707 HL. Now this guy looks a little tricky. Looks like it's not a plain weld. You see, we got two weld patterns loaded like this. Well, if you look at this, you can say, wait a minute, I got this force here, and that's going to cause shear stresses like this and MoMA stresses. All those are in plane. You can actually analyze this by just collapsing it on the other axis, on the z-axis. If you just calculate the properties of one of these sets of welds and then multiply it by two, that will give you the total torsional resistance, and this is an in-plane weld. This guy, you can see this force. The vertical force is going to give us components in plane, but it's also going to give us a moment that gives us out-of-plane components, therefore this is an out-of-plane weld pattern. This is uh, just <clears throat> applying our method to a simple example out of Shigley. You can see we have a all-around weld, and you'll notice that my table here is a little more complicated. This table actually does a few more things, and uh, it automates a little more than you guys are ready to automate. You're not going to need all these columns. In fact, you shouldn't try to do all these columns. This actually does all the stresses for me. You can ignore column K and onward. You can call, ignore everything under row 21. And you can even ignore a few of these columns I have. You're going to have an N in your table for the number of each weld. You're going to have an H in each of your table. And you're going to have a L of each. Now you'll notice I have two L's because I'm using a fancy technique for calculating this that I was experimenting with. You just need one L for your welds, okay? You're going to put in your X position and Y position of each and every weld. So you're going to have the H column, one L column. You're going to have an X and a Y column. You're going to have an area column. You know how to calculate that. You're going to have an AX and an AY column. And then you're going to have this J column where you apply the other formula. You're going to use my equation to calculate the moment of the center of the pattern. That's this MZ over here at the CG. You get your properties of the weld here. And then you will go off and then you'll just uh, write out your equations for the shear stress in each direction and putting those together separately. Don't try and do all the stresses automatically. This is rather complicated. The way I developed that and it'll be hard for you to understand probably. Okay. Here is an out of plane uh, analysis of another example out of Shigley. Once again, this table is a little more complicated than you need. You're just going to need the number of each weld, the H of each weld, one L dimension for each weld, an X and a Y, an area, AX, AY, and one I. To and then you calculate your stresses separately. Okay? So that is how we analyze welds with a simplified model that involves just calculating basically some rather simple stresses on the weld. Make sure you spend enough time immersed in this and doing your homework to understand it. This is a very practical set of methods that will help you anytime you encounter a weld out there in industry. Enjoy.